All right, uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Ivan de Oliveira Nunes. He's uh, one of our own PhD students, one of our own super successful PhD students. And uh, I'm happy to announce uh, that he will be joining uh, the Rochester Institute of Technology in fall as a new assistant professor of computing security. So that's great. And that's why we also asked them to um, give a talk, you know, for other grad students, you know, to see what like a successful PhD research looks like, right? So um, uh, before UCI, uh, Ivan obtained a computer engineering degree at the Federal University of Espirito Santos in Brazil. And he also has a master's degree from Federal University of Minas Gerais, like also in Brazil. And in recent years, he has worked on several topics, including IoT security, content-centric networking security, secure multi-party computation, biometric-based authentication and opportunistic mobile networking. And his research interests in general span the fields of security and privacy, embedded systems, computer networking, applied cryptography, and especially their interse intersection. So uh, without further ado, uh, Ivan, please uh, take it away. Thank you, Ardalan. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. It's a great pleasure to give this talk here at UCI today. Um, and in this talk, I'm gonna be talking about probably my favorite research topic across the all, all areas that Ardalan mentioned, which uh, whenever someone asks me in general what I do, that's what I tell them. I tell that I, them that I, I I, my research is about building sensors that cannot lie, or more, more generally speaking, IoT devices or embedded systems that cannot lie. And in the research lingo, this tra typically translates to providing verified integrity to resource constrained embedded systems. So as Ardalan was saying, uh, my, research, uh, my research is divided in three main classes of, of, of topics, security and privacy, this is my core topic, I also like to work on embedded systems and more generally systems and computer networking. At the beginning, I was telling that this is a, in the intersection of this many things that I like to do related to security, embedded systems and computer networking. And because it's so multidisciplinary, I hope this can be of interest to, to many people. And uh, I'm gonna tell you a three, three part story in uh, realizing this goal of building the sensors that cannot lie that goes through remote attestation. That means uh, a security service for measuring memory on remote devices. Uh, and then an architecture for provable execution of whatever software is installed on these devices. Uh, I was mentioning that uh, the fourth part is optional depending on how we do on time. I'm pretty sure we're not going to cover that <laughs> because of this technical difficulty, but let's hope uh, we can cover parts one and two raised in Apex. So very well, uh, as we know, we're getting surrounded by this uh, IoT cyber physical system devices, and they uh, are in several environments from home automation to smart factories and industrial facilities. And in this settings, what we typically see is that there's a more powerful uh, controller that is represented by the by the phone in the bottom in, in the picture at the bottom right, and this or, or a, a, a main ECU in a car. And this controller typically relies on actions taken by or measurements made by uh, this tiny sensors and actuators. And one of the points I'm gonna to try to make is that, let me just, is that, and as a community in security, we put a lot of effort in trying to secure this high-end devices, these controllers, because of course they are very important for the system, but the controllers themselves, they rely on the, on the low-end sensors and actuators to uh, make decisions, right? They rely on sense quantities and actions performed by this edge devices that are very resource constrained. So as, as a silly example, you can consider a, a fire sensor, right? And you trust the fire sensor to report that everything is okay when everything is okay. But if something bad comes up, the controller trusts the fire sensor to tell the truth and report that something bad is going on. The problem is that the sensors, they like any other computing entity, they can be compromised, uh, for example, infected by malware. And then uh, what could happen is that something bad like a fire starts and the sensor simply, malware that now controls the sensor simply lies about what's happening. And then the controller will not know 
and will fail to send help or to take uh, actions to remedy the situation. So uh, to a large extent, one of the reasons why we, we as a community in security tend to forget about these devices is not because we don't want to secure them, is, that, is, is because they are very challenging to secure. So these devices, they're typically designed for low, low cost, low energy and small size. They have small amounts of memory, typically a few kilobytes of program memory, a few kilobytes of data memory, uh, single core CPUs, simple communication interfaces. And a few good examples of these devices are the TI MSP430, and the uh, AVR 8 Mega 32, AVR 8 Mega 32, if you're familiar with Arduino, this is the brain inside the Arduino. This is the processor inside the Arduino devices, which are quite popular. So very challenging to secure, right? And uh, with that, we have a problem at hand. Um, given the potential that this device is, the software on this device can be fully compromised, how to trust results or data produced by this simple uh, and remote embedded devices. And can we bind the produced results or data to the execution of the expected software? And finally, can we do this cost effectively? Meaning that even if all software on the device can be compromised at any point in time, can we still have some guarantees? And can we have these guarantees to be implemented in a way that you know it doesn't double the cost of the device or it doesn't uh, makes energy 10 times more expensive and things as such? So what we actually want in the end is that a sensor that uh, even when potentially compromised will always tell the truth or this controller device will be able to detect if the sensor is actually lying about the sense quantity. So that's our, our goal and our problem at hand here. So am I still on? <laughs> yes. Good. Confirm. Um, and uh, in achieving this goal, we, we kind of navigate through a, a set of constraints here. At the one hand, we want as much functionality as possible. At the other hand, of course, we want to keep the hardware cost minimal and this conflict with each other. So to solve this problem, what we usually do is that we go for hardware software co-designs where we do some part of it in hardware, do some part of it in software and, 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 and compose the two of them. And this inc increases the complexity. It's easy to get it wrong. So the other dimension of this work is that we try to uh, make up for the increase on in the design complexity by pushing for provable security and formal verification, meaning that whatever guarantees our systems are providing are backed up by the formal verification of both the protocol and the implementation realized in the protocol. So the hardware, the software, and their composition, the implementation of these things should be formally verified in provable security. So we kind of navigate through this, this space of constraints and try to hit the, the sweet spot between all of them. So without further ado, let's get into the first part of what is remote attestation and how we realize a formally verified remote attestation, which is the first part towards achieving this goal of building the sensors that cannot lie. And uh, remote attestation is basically a, a protocol that allows um, for remotely measuring memory of a device. So that's typically, it's typically a two-party interaction where you have a, a verifier. This is a trusted device represented by the controller in our example, right? That wants to measure the software state of a potentially compromised prover. And the prover is the, the low-end resource-constrained IoT device in our example, the fire sensor, right? And uh, uh, this is generally an approach to that enables detection of malware because it allows the verifier to measure which software is currently installed in the memory of the, this, this resource constraint prover, right? And the remote decision protocol looks a lot like a challenge response based authentication protocol, right? So if you took a, a, a security course before, you're probably familiar with this picture. The difference is that uh, the prover doesn't only authenticate itself, it also authenticates the, the contents of its own memory. So whatever software is installed in the prover, it's a part of this authentication protocol and gets authenticated by the verifier. And it works by having the verifier issuing a challenge. The prover is supposed to compute an authenticated integrity ensuring function over the challenge and its own memory. And uh, the idea here, as in any authentication protocol, is that there's a secret key and only the device that has access to the secret key is able to compute the response that will be accepted by the verifier. So it cannot be forged by some other device. And then the verifier will know that the, actually this memory, this, this, this software is installed in the memory of the proof. 
So all of that is very simple. If we don't consider the threat model here, which means, which is that the adversary may have may have full control over the the prover's software state. So basically, uh, we have to worry about things such as, uh, well, I just said there's a secret key, right? What if malware infects this device and steals the secret key and sends it to somewhere else? or just uses the secret key to forge the response instead of actually computing the response, uh, the, the, the authenticated integrity ensuring function over the proof of memory. It just forges and lies about it, right? If, if it has access to the key, it can do that. So that's what makes this problem challenging. But, uh, and the goal of this is that if secure, this interaction must provide an, an unforgeable proof that the prover's memory corresponds to a given value at the time of the computation of this remote attestation even if the prover is infected fully, right? So that is the goal here or the first step. There are some flavors or types of remote attestation that have been proposed. And uh, since we have full software compromise, this directly implies that we're gonna need some hardware support. And uh, because you, know, you have to at least store a key. If you can't store the key securely, the whole scheme is broken, right? And then there are some, uh, Flavor, some types of a, a type of remote attestation that's hardware based. And this means that you have dedicated hardware to fully support the entire remote attestation protocol in hardware. Uh, the problem is that the solutions that exist for that type of remote attestation uh, are typically an overkill. They're too costly for this low end embedded devices. They're the cheapest ones that I know of are at least 10 times more costly than devices we're trying to secure themselves. And uh, it is in terms of monetary costs, in terms of energy, about 100 to 1,000 times more costly. So it doesn't really apply. Uh, but there is a hope. There is one approach that tries to bring this ability of uh, computing remote attestation to low end devices. And it's a hybrid approach based on hardware software co designs. And the idea is to have the minimum amount of hardware support uh, just enough to make the attestation secure and keep the rest of the system in software. So basically, this integrity ensuring function uh, that's used to, comp to compute something over the proof of memory uh, is implemented entirely in software. And there's a minimal hardware module that supports the secure execution of this uh, software that computes the attestation function. And this uh, integrity ensuring function, it can be implemented, for example, as a message authentication code or a digital signature that is computed over the entire memory of the device, thus authenticating the contents of memory. So very well, um, there's been a lot of work in achieving this, uh, this uh, service securely. And uh, the, there's a lot of research going on and the, the research community arrived at this picture that I have right now, um, where the security of the remote attestation protocol boils down to two main classes of properties, key protection, and safe execution. And as the name might hint, key protection has to do with making sure that the secret that is necessary and stored at the prover is never leaked, despite uh, the fact that the prover might be compromised. And this, uh, prop this, this bigger property itself can be deconstructed into two uh, smaller properties. The first one, key access control, means that whatever this key is stored, it cannot be accessed by unprivileged software, meaning any software other than the, the attestation implementation itself, right? So potentially, uh, potential malware cannot go and steal this key. The second related property is key confidentiality. And it means that, well, uh, bad, untrusted software cannot access the key, but the attestation software needs to access the key to be able to compute the attestation. So we need to make sure that when this trusted software accesses the key, it doesn't accidentally leak the key in any way, not before, not during, not after the attestation computation, right? And then the second class of properties, safe execution has to do with making sure that this attestation uh, software is actually implemented correctly and runs correctly. And this breaks down to four sub properties. The first one, functional correctness means that this software should be implemented, uh, this implementation should provably correspond to the cryptographic function being used. For example, if I use a digital signature or a, a SHA-256 based HMAC, uh, this implementation, the code that I write to implement this and execute in a device to compute at the station 
should provably correspond to the cryptographic specification of this function and therefore enjoy its cryptographic properties. So me, basically meaning that I implement the attestation software correctly. And uh, related to that, we have immutability because you know the device, the threat model here is that device will be compromised or maybe compromised. And uh, it doesn't matter if I have the correct implementation there, if the malware that compromises the device can just modify the implementation to whatever it wants. Remembering that uh, this implementation that's there has access to the attestation key, right? So if it can be modified, malware can just modify it to, for example, leak the key or forge attestation results that don't correspond to the contents of the device's memory. Now, the remaining two properties are uh, controlled invocation. And this means that this attestation software uh, should only be invoked in a safe way, meaning that uh, it always executes uh, or it's always called from its first instruction. That's the only way to guarantee that any software has the intended behavior is it, if it executes as a whole, right? So uh, in addition to having the correct software there to have the guarantee that we will compute uh, the integrity ensuring function and not some other funny behavior, for example, that could leak the key, we need to make sure that the software is called properly. And atomicity means that once the software is running, it cannot be interrupted uh, by any other software in the device. And I will explain in the next slide why atomicity is required. So, uh, but before that, the question that we ask in this raised paper is whether these properties are sufficient, people believe they are, and whether they can be obtained provably by the implementation of the hardware and software realizing them. And in this paper, we show that indeed they are sufficient. We, we have a proof of that. And uh, we verified that the hardware software implementation uh, actually uh, implements this, each of these properties correctly. So as I promised, uh, why do we need atomicity? And this is uh, this, this slide tells you why. So let's assume we have a this is the device memory that's divided in, in six blocks. And then we start computing at the station and we don't have atomicity, so the station can be interrupted. The attestation starts measuring memory, right? And it runs until it covered up to block four. At this point, malware, which resides in block five, interrupts the attestation functionality and copies itself to block two. And now it allows the attestation functionality to resume normally. It will continue that's in memory up to block six. So what the verifier will see as the result of this computation reflects a malware-free state on the device, even though what happened is that malware relocated itself to avoid detection. And this is a well-known type of malware called roving malware. And like I said, controlled invocation, invoking this code as a whole is important to prevent, uh, for example, malware to jump in the middle of the attestation code triggering potential return-oriented programming attacks that can trigger arbitrary behavior uh, of this uh, privileged software. And recall that this software has access to the key, so triggering an arbitrary behavior of that software, it's very dangerous. So uh, let's look into how Braze realizes each of these properties. Before that, am I still on? <laughs> yes. And I actually Good. have a quick question. Great. So, um, so the previous slide, are you mentioning that like uh, with remote attestation, like with exactly like what you're describing, we can detect like ROP attacks? Uh, no, no. Just with remote attestation, you cannot. There's a, a service that builds on top of remote attestation called, uh, well, they, they, they're generally called runtime attestation services and there's control flow attestation and data flow attestation. So they, just doing the memory, Yes, yeah. what, what we're trying to prevent here is not ROP attacks in general in the device. We're trying to prevent ROP attacks that execute gadgets of the attestation code itself. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, thank you for the question. Um, so, Vray's architecture. There's a lot of uh, stuff in this in this this sketch of the architecture, but uh, I'm going to cross out the parts that we don't have to worry about now. And these are actually the parts that we add to the device. So if you ignore them, what you're left with is uh, the CPU core. This is the, the, the CPU implementation itself, a memory backbone that's used by the CPU to access memory. And you have RAM, which implements the data memory of the device. 
and you have flash, which is the program memory of the device. So this is just the unmodified uh, microcontroller. So let's look at, into the things that we add to this device. Right, so this orange block over there, it's a ROM, read-only memory. And this is something we add to store the implementation of the attestation software itself and the attestation key. Right? So it's since it's read only, even if the device is compromised, it cannot be modified by malware. That will be a hardware attack. Um, and what we store in this read only memory is a formally verified implementation of, uh, in, in Grace's case, uh, SHA 256 based HMAC. Right? So by doing that, we get two of the properties I mentioned. You get functional correctness, because this is a provably secure implement, software implementation of this HMAC function, and you get immutability because it's stored in ROM. Right? And all the rest in Braised is done by this uh, additional hardware module in the purple box at the bottom. So the other remaining things is to make sure that the software executes properly, that it has controlled invocation, and that it has atomicity. And this hardware module will take care of that. So this gives us uh, another two properties. And in addition to that, we need to make sure that this uh, nothing is learned about the key that is stored here in ROM. And what the way uh, Raise achieves that is by using this hardware module to monitor all access to memory and to prevent any access to the key memory that doesn't come through uh, from the, the software at the station itself, right? The only access allowed to this key memory region is the one that's showing by the arrow in blue here. Now, the attestation software also has to execute, right? And when it executes, it needs to allocate memory in RAM. Um, so what this hardware module also makes sure is that uh, this, once this, uh, no, no traces of the key that are allocated during the execution of the attestation software remain or are accessible to other software running on the device. And the way it does that is by having this uh, reserved part of RAM, this exclusive stack that can only be written and read by the attestation code itself. So even if the traces of the key remain there, no other software can access that region. And this is also enforced by this hardware module. And that gives us the remaining properties. So, so if I have we, one more question. If yes, you don't watch. Can you uh, clarify your, your assumptions about potential physical attacks like? Uh... Yes, absolutely. Uh, so physical attacks are, there are two types, right? There's invasive physical attacks and non-invasive. So invasive physical attacks, they modify the hardware itself. And this, we cannot deal with them. They're generally, deal, uh, they're generally dealt with by offering physical protection measures. Right? Mm -hmm. There's another type of physical attacks that is the non-invasive type, which means someone plugs a wire to the device and reprograms the device normally, as, as someone installing some software on the device will do. In those cases, we deal with them. Right? Um, but uh, you're right. Uh, physical attacks, since we're implementing things in hardware, if someone can modify the hardware that we add into the device, we cannot deal with that. So I think I was thinking of something more like specific. If you go back to your diagram that you're yes. showing. Mm -hmm. So um, if like the attacker can snoop the boss, right? Anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then will the will it, will the attacker be able to extract the key to see the key at some yes. point? Yes, or uh, because you know everything, even the, the attestation software is executed by the processor, right? So if right. the attacker can snoop a register in the process or all registers, it will right. see the entire computation, right? So mm -hmm. uh, yes, you're correct. If you can uh, physically get to the wire that is inside the, the, the silicon, that's inside the chip and snoop in there, you can, uh, you can. Oh, so I see. But I guess that's like where the question lies. So is like, um, is the the memory? Is it like on, on chip? Like because so I understand. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah. That's a very good question. Actually, the whole figure that I'm showing you in there, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. inside one one silicon chip. Oh, I see. Everything like is getting into something the package. You attach. It's Got manufactured it. like that. I see. Fair enough. You know, I, I agree. That's that's a very hard attack. I thought it's like you know memory is sitting outside, so you're going over a 
bus, and then that's an easy attack, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. like uh, that, that will apply to, to TPMs, for, for, for example. And that has right. happened with TPMs, because TPM, you plug some additional hardware to, the, right. to your computer. All right, thank you. Very good point. Um, so going back to, OK, how does uh, this hardware module work? So it basically monitors a set of CPU signals to detect this violations to the properties we want. For example, it checks the program counter, and that tells you which instruction is executing at a given time. So by checking the program counter, I can know if the software, uh, the attestation software is running or some untrusted software is running. It also checks the read, enable, and write, enable bits along with the data address bit. And these are used by the CPU to access memory. So if the CPU is currently accessing, uh, performing a read to memory, uh, the, the, the address of that read will be reflected by this DADDR bit, uh, the, this DADDR signal, which is actually 16 bits in this device. And if it's a read, the read enable bit will be set to one. If it's a write, the write enable bit is set to one. So this allows us to implement properties such as oh, if the attestation code is running, and that means that PC points to an instruction uh, at the attestation code location, and the key uh, uh, is being read, so read enable is set and the data address is within the key address range. Now that's okay. But if the PC is outside, that's not okay. This means uh, some untrusted software is trying to access the key, right? And we also monitor the equivalent signals for DMA. DMA is direct memory access controllers and those can access memory in parallel with the CPU. So we have to uh, be aware of those as well. And what this hardware does is that whenever such vulnerabilities or, or, or violations are detected, it issues a, an immediate reset of the device. So the, 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 it basically prevents this uh, violation to the security properties immediately before it takes place. So um, there's a big part of it, which has to do with the remote, uh, the, the formal verification of this architecture. And uh, the, so why should we care, right? The first, the first point is that, uh, just by formally specifying something that provides some unambiguous logical uh, representation for what you want to achieve. And the stock so far, I told you about the properties at a high level and you might or might not have understood exactly what I mean. And that's because our language is ambiguous. But if you formally specify your requirements in logic, that's already a nice way to uh, communicate them uh, in an unambiguous way. But if you do that, what you also, what you also able to do is that you can now use a computer to uh, assist you in checking that the implementation, the design uh, actually adheres uh, to these specifications. And this is what's typically called formal verification, right? And it can be, can be achieved in different ways, model checking, theory improving, and so on. Finally, uh, you can ask the question that I mentioned in the beginning, which is, uh, can, uh, there are many properties, as I, as I told you, uh, and you can ask the question, are these properties enough or are they sufficient to imply some more meaningful notion uh, of security, right? So you can compose them together and you can use logical equivalences assisted by a computer to prove that they imply some more meaningful notion of security. And uh, we actually do this in this, in this raised paper, we state this end-to-end -end goal of security as a cryptographic security game. That's the, the usual cryptographic framework for stating security properties. And we <clears throat> basically design each uh, hardware submodule implementing each of those properties that I mentioned and also the software. And we verify each part using a particular formal system and logic of choice. And then we compose them together uh, into this, uh, into this uh, prove that they imply this end-to-end -end notion of secure remote attestation. I was going to give you an example on that, uh, but I'm gonna skip in the interest of time and I will go into the, the second part, which is uh, brings us back to the, the problem at hand, which is building sensors that cannot lie. So, um, you know, to understand, how, what we need to achieve that goal of building these sensors that can apply, we need to understand how the sensing process actually works on this MCUs. And basically what happens is that you have this uh, sensing hardware or the sensing circuit 
that is, it's not a computer, it's not programmable, it's just a circuit. And it performs the conversion of the physical quantities to digital values that are used by the microcontroller. This is either some digital or analog circuit, right? And this circuit is connected to a specific ports on the device, physical ports that are referred to as GPIO. And GPIO is nothing else than a physical port that is hardwired to memory. So software can read or write to this port and therefore it can communicate with the physical world to the, with the circuit realizing this sensing actuation. But for this to work, the software on the MCU has to uh, adhere to a protocol to communicate and configure the actual circuit that performs the sensing. So in order to be sure that the sensed values that we are obtaining or that we are, or the, command, the comments that we are issuing to the circuits that are connected to the CPU, uh, it, that they actually occur as expected. In order to make sure of that, we need to prove that a value was indeed obtained through the expected GPIO interface via the execution of the expected software, meaning the expected protocol, right? So we need something more than attestation. <laughs> it's kind of natural to think that uh, we can use attestation to build sensors that cannot lie because it tells us that the software, the proper software is installed on the device, but uh, unfortunately it doesn't prove that the, the software that is installed ever executes. And it doesn't bind any outputs to the execution of that code. So for example, if we attempt to use just remote attestation to, to build sensors that cannot lie, what could happen is that you attest the software and then a compromise happens and then you execute and you end up with the wrong value, right? That spoof value by malware. If you attest after executing, what could happen is that the device, the compromised software executes and then it deletes itself to convince you that something else executed. <clears throat> and even if you attest before and after, what could happen is that after the first attestation, <clears throat> the device gets compromised and before the, the, the second attestation, the, the malware goes away to full the verifier that the right thing executed when in fact the value you're receiving is a lie. Right, so the, the the point is that clever malware tries to hide itself and convince you that you're getting the right thing, and the takeaway is that even the ideal uh, remote attestation functionality by itself is not sufficient. We need something more, <clears throat> and this is the goal of the second part, which is proofs of execution. Right, so what is a proof of execution per se? It's a cryptographic binding between the executed code, any outputs produced by this execution and a temporally consistent remote attestation of the executed code. And temporally consistent means that in between the time the software executes and produces some output, neither the executable nor the output itself has changed before subsequent attestation. So when you attest, you're actually attesting the same software that execu executed and the same output that was produced by this execution. And we implement that functionality as an extension of the array capability in our case, we extend our own work raised. And in doing the, in achieving this, this ability, we have to be mindful of, of our, our initial goal of low and low cost uh, uh, devices and the possibility of so full software compromise, which implies that we're gonna have some hardware support. So let's look into how we realize that very briefly. The idea is that with cost in mind, the simplest thing we can do is to set one bit. And this is what we refer for as uh, the, the exact flag, exact for execution. Right? And the, the idea is that this minimal formally verified hardware in Apex will control the value of this exact flag. And an, an exact flag value of one uh, indicates that the attested software has in fact executed properly. And an exact value of zero implies that the software didn't execute or that the execution was tempered with in some way. Perhaps the executable was interrupted or the execution cha was changed, or the output was tempered with. Right? Something went wrong. This exact flag is, it is, is stored in a specific physical location uh, and a specific part of physical memory that is covered by the remote attestation measurement itself. So by the security of remote attestation, uh, that means that it is impossible to forge an exact value, right? So the problem becomes or is reduced now to controlling the exact flag itself. 
uh, because the exact flag will be covered by the attestation and therefore it will be authenticated. It can, uh, if the underlying attestation is secure, uh, it should be impossible to spoof the, the exact flag that the Apex Harbor controls. So yeah, the, the problem is reduced to controlling the exact flag. And, uh, but before we do that, we, we need to know what proper execution means to control the exact flag accordingly. And in the context of Apex, it means three things. It means that the executable runs atomically, uninterrupted from its first instruction until its last instruction, that the execution is timely, meaning that uh, it has happened before you, uh, it happens after receiving the latest attestation challenge. And this is important to prevent replay attacks. For example, if you're querying your fire sensor to know if there's a fire right now, you need to get a response for right now. You shouldn't uh, accept a response for an execution that happened five hours ago, right? And the third point is that neither the executable nor outputs are modified between execution and subsequent attestation. This is the temporal consistency aspect. So how do we achieve that, right? So in the right, at the right part of the slide here, we have the attested memory. This is the memory that will be covered by the attestation functionality, by the attestation measurement. And the, the, the gray part in this figure is a set of physical addresses reserved to store configuration parameters about this execution. So they store the exact flag itself, which is controlled by, by Apex, uh, the challenge, the attestation challenge that's uh, received from the verifier, and they also store pointers defining the output range. This is the location where the output of the execution should be stored. And the executable range, this is the pointers defining where the executable itself is stored in memory. And this uh, metadata should be written before execution, such that the attestation computation will prove uh, execution for this particular ranges and, and, and values. And the idea here is that Apex hardware will monitor these values along with the same CPU values that raise monitor the program counter data access values and so on. And it will control the exact flag accordingly. So, you know, before execution starts, you should write these values to metadata. And uh, the default value of the exact flag is zero. That's the default value when the device boots or when the reset happens or, you know, after any violation to Apex security, the exact flag is zero. And uh, the only way to set it to one is to have the program counter to point to the first instruction in the ER range, right? Uh, which means essentially calling the, this executable properly through its proper entry point. Right? And then this software will start executing. And in the middle, it may be interrupted by several things. A reset might happen. Uh, direct memory access controllers might uh, do things trying to tamper with the data memory on the device, the intermediate computation results, or an interrupt might have been programmed by malware before the execution started to interrupt this execution. And if any of these things happen, Apex uh, will set the exact flag back to zero. And the only way to set it back to one is to start execution over, right? So the point is that the only way to leave the, the ER range without setting this exact flag to zero is to complete the execution of this executable as a whole until its legal exit. And there are some key observations here that, uh, that uh, in order to bind the execution to the produced output, this uh, software should be implemented in a way that it writes the results of interest to the OR range as specified in the metadata. So at this point, if execution happens successfully, uh, the good guys are done. The honest prover is done. What it basically does is that it computes attestation of this picture that's in here right now, and that will reflect an exact value of one. But the bad guys can still try to do things after execution is completed and before uh, attestation starts. Uh, for example, they can try to modify the executable to try to convince the verifier that something else executed instead of uh, what's expected. They can try to spoof the output by modifying it directly in the OR range. Or they can try to modify the challenge. By overriding challenges, you can produce proofs for new challenges with old uh, computation results, triggering replay attacks, as I mentioned in the beginning. Or um, they can try to spoof, the, uh, to, to modify the pointers that define ER and OR regions. 
And this is equivalent to modifying ER and OR regions themselves in an, in an attempt to try to convince the verifier that something else executed. And if any of these violations occurred, what happens is that the Apex uh, sets the exec flag to zero immediately, and then the subsequent attestation will not reflect the, the expected case, which is exec uh, equals to one, and the verifier will reject that. So to sum up what happens in, in one slide is that, you know, the verifier will define this metadata, which means where the software should be installed and where the outputs should go and we'll send it to the, the prover, potentially uh, optionally uh, uh, accompanied by the software that should execute itself. And the untrusted, unprivileged software in the prover is responsible for uh, installing the received code to the proper location, setting the, this metadata accordingly, and executing the code, producing the output, and then invoking raise at the station functionality. And it, it, it's untrusted, so it may or may not do that, but Apex hardware will monitor each of these steps and control the exact flag accordingly. So uh, in order to produce a proof of execution that is accepted by the verifier, the exact value should be one. And um, with that, the verifier can receive back the proof along with the output and verify that this output was indeed produced by the correct expected execution of the expected software on this particular device, which is our goal of building sensors that cannot lie. So, as you might expect, a large part of this work goes into formalizing and proving that these properties are implemented correctly, and then proving that these properties together combine, they imply some end-to-end -end notion of uh, secure proofs of execution. Uh, if you're interesting, interested in that part, you can look at our paper, uh, which is publicly available. And, uh, but in the context of this talk, I'm gonna skip, of course, because we're running out of time. What I want to say is that we actually did implement this. Uh, we went back to our goal, which was implementing sensors that can lie. And we did implement this uh, temperature, uh, this, this fire sensor that cannot lie um, by using Apex to prove execution of the, the, the software, the sensing routine. And everything that I described here, by the way, including the proofs, the, the implementations, the proofs, and so on, they are available on GitHub. My last slide that I'm going to cover today is uh, about uh, cost. And remember, I mentioned that hardware approaches are, are too expensive. Um, this approach, both raised and Apex combined, uh, have an overall cost about 10% on top of the, the, the lowest end microcontroller that we could use, which is the TI MSP430. And uh, this is a microcontroller that costs 50 cents. So it's pretty affordable, and this is a consequence of the hybrid design of pushing as much as uh, as much stuff as possible to the software side and keeping the hardware minimal just to detect violations to that. So there's something to be said, like coming back to Ardalan's question about control flow at the station and, and, and data flow at the station. Uh, there are some details here that I'm not going to cover. There's not enough time. But one interesting thing is that Apex uh, by itself is sufficient as the single hardware support to implement control flow attestation, uh, control flow attestation and data flow attestation, which enable detection of uh, ROP type attacks or attacks that exploit vulnerabilities in the executable itself. So that's uh, something really interesting that we, we, we were able to show later on after the, the early Apex paper. So I guess we're running out of time. I'm gonna stop here and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions that you might have. I apologize for the connectivity issue and I had to rush a little bit with the rest of the presentation to try to finish almost in time. So apologies for that. And I hope this was uh, useful and interesting, at least to some of you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yeah, this was great. Uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, I'll stop sharing here so that I can see uh, the Zoom. Sure, you can uh, put your questions in chat or just raise your hand and I will allow you to directly ask. Okay, so while uh, folks are thinking about their questions, I have one more question, kind of like follow up to what I asked earlier about the physical attacks, right? Uh, so I wondered like, uh, we're talking about sensors, right? And you wanna make sure that the 
sensors don't lie, right? And so uh, there should there will be some physical sensor connected to GPIOs, right, yeah. to the device. So all the, the the remote attestation that you covered it mainly covered the execution, yeah, right, of software on that uh, on the device. But what if the attacker simply just connects? something else to the GPIO pins. I think that seems to be then the easiest attack. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah, and this is a, yeah. yeah, and this is a physical, perhaps non-invasive attack, right? Yes, That's because the, it's easy, right? GPIO yeah, is yeah. out of the CPU package. If, if the device itself, the peripheral that you're connecting doesn't support any form of authentication mm -hmm. of itself as a part of its protocol, there's mm -hmm. no way to solve that, right? The only way to solve that is by physically protecting access to the device. Right? right, which you, you can use to, to increase the, the bar. From the microcontroller's pers perspective, right? If that happens, it's still it, it is still not lying. It's being lied to, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Like, uh, I'm not Are poking they... hole in your solution, but in the overall yeah. picture, right? If I want to mm -hmm. have trust yeah, totally in possible, anymore. indeed. Yes, and uh, yeah, one way is to build this. Because typically those those actual circuits they're not programmable they're, they're not computers right they're analog or digital circuits they're hard yeah. hardware and uh, one way is to support authentication of the particular piece of, of circuit that you you use typically it's not there right. right so the other the only other way is to provide some kind of physical protection of the device like putting it inside the box or something like that mm -hmm. but other than that uh, it's very hard right yeah. Yeah, makes sense. But one one point is that the, doing that would require physical presence, right? Yeah. Uh, which is harder to obtain as well. Like well, compromising malware compromise of devices can be done remotely, right? Sure. Uh, versus this kind of this case where you have to actually unplug something and plug something else. Or the other alternative is uh, you attack the device by you know changing the physical environment, like using a lighter to close to your fire sensor and, and mm -hmm. causing uh yeah 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 makes sense okay there's a question in the chat i'm gonna read it uh for apex what happens if exec equal to zero for critical devices like small uh, smoke detectors does it mean that the device becomes useless or stop working uh does this cause safety risks mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the the whole architecture is about proving execution, right? It doesn't enforce it doesn't enforce execution and it doesn't prevent execution. What happens when the exact flag is equal to zero is that the verifier will detect that the value it's receiving right now wasn't produced by the execution of the software that the verifier wanted to be there, right? So in the case of the fire sensor, you can think of some. Uh, some cases, right? If you're, if, if the verifier is the fire department, right? If you get uh, no fire report with exec equals to one, you know, you can trust it and you know that the, the, the place is fine, right? If you get a, a yes fire with exec is equal to one, you know that uh, there is a fire going on, you should check, right? If you get a no fire with exec equals to zero, that means that you're getting a report claiming that there was no fire, but this was executed, this was not produced by the intended execution. So this is potentially spoofed and potentially produced by malware. Probably you would check, right? You try to reach the people in there, to the people in there, or you would send help anyway, because you know you cannot trust the data you're receiving. Does that answer the question? Okay, very well. Like yeah, thank you for the question. Any other questions? Okay, so if there are no questions, like uh, yeah, I'll just uh, make uh, one comment here. Uh, you know, I, I've just uh, been in the academic job market. I know that a lot of PhD students are uh, thinking about that or planning uh, something like that, and. Uh, if you have any questions or want to know about my experience and to help prepare your own for your own job applications in the future, please feel free to, to, to reach out. I'm happy to help any UCI student that's 
looking for that. So yeah, and thank you for for attending. Yeah, that would be great. That would be great. Yeah, I like. I think we are thinking uh, of potentially maybe organizing like a meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, where if like uh, PhD students are interested in pursuing that, you know, like uh, we can just brainstorm and share experiences, right? So like if you're available, maybe we can have you join that meeting as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm happy to, to share my own experiences through the process, which is, uh, as you know, <laughs> challenging. Yes, it's a challenging, it's a challenging process. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks a lot, everyone, and good luck. Good luck yeah. with your uh, new uh, new job. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. Bye bye.